Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Roto World Football Show. I am Patrick Darty, joined Tuesday, January 30th, by Mr. Denny Carter. We are in the afterglow of the conference championship round, but uh, we're not going to really talk about that. Save for one really controversial decision, we will begin the show. Uh, you'll just have to spend the next 90 seconds guessing what it might be. Uh, we'll talk to that about that. We'll talk about Ben Johnson going full Josh McDaniels and, quote, spurning the commanders and Seahawks, or was he turned down? The spin is already like so unbelievably out of control. I haven't really seen anything like it. We'll dig into the Ben Johnson story. <laughs> well, Denny, I will proudly put fantasy in bio uh, for the talk, talk about how unserious it is that the Steelers have hired Arthur Smith as their offensive coordinator, at least make him be a tight ends coach first. Right. Uh, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about Kellen Moore as the new offensive coordinator in Philly. We'll talk about Zach Robinson a Sean McVay disciple, of which there are now at least 12 or 13, um, as Falcons offensive coordinator. Uh, Ken Dorsey is an offensive coordinator again. Joe Brady, officially an offensive coordinator again. Um, we got some other stuff maybe if we have time that we'll get to. But yeah, Denny, it's the hottest news everyone's been talking about for uh, – we're kind of late to it, talking about Dan Campbell. <laughs> uh, but we have been arguing about it. The, uh, the Twitter flame wars, as they used to be known, have not ended. Since a Sunday evening with the two fourth down calls heard around the world, uh, you have suggested maybe Josh Reynolds should just catch the ball once was just part once. of your part of your argument. But uh, do, you have, do you have a rant, a soliloquy to go on about the infamous Dan Campbell decisions on Sunday night? So, I, you know, I put my rant in, in writing form and you can find that on NBC Sports dot com little website. We like to we like to visit uh, for my column, which is headlined and you'll be shocked. By this headline, uh, Dan Campbell did nothing wrong. The most online headline I've ever heard in my life. But, uh... <laughs> it's only someone completely, <laughs> completely toxically, chronically online could write that headline, and that was me. Um, so yeah, uh, read that for my full thoughts. But uh, it was—I thought it was—I thought it was great. I, I, I really do see it. I wrote—I wrote this that I see it as something of a watershed moment in the football analytics movement, if that's what you want to call it, is a, a head coach truly going for it, like keeping his foot on the gas throughout the game against a superior opponent. I think everybody would admit that. Even Lions fans say, okay, the Niners are better than us, saying, no, we are not going to get by on field goals. We're not going to win this game. Uh, 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 giving in in the red zone and kicking field goals, right? And <clears throat> he didn't, and they lost, and so it's going to be a disaster, and they're going to say, like the Wall Street Journal said, uh, the math failed Dan Campbell. And it actually, it didn't. The math was was kind to Dan Campbell. He actually did the right thing. My argument, Pat, is that Dan Campbell, I'm not, and I'm not trying to be contrarian, I'm not trying to trigger anyone, but he wasn't aggressive enough in this game, he should have gone for it on fourth down before the end of the first half. And instead he settled for a field goal. That, that was a turning point. I was furious watching it in real time. And it turns out that the analytics bear that out. It was a mistake. It was. And that was the one moment where Dan Campbell kind of lost his Brandon Staley nerve. And yeah, that was always the deal with Brandon Staley. So I'm the analytics guy. And then at all the most important moments, he never was where he had that syndrome where he seemed like he got so in his own head, Brandon Staley, that he would kick when he should punt, punt when he should kick. And like, he he lost like track of the narrative in his head. Like, am I the analytics guy? Does the math work? Does it not work? And I did think Dan Campbell should have gone for it at the end of the first half. And what I really come down to, though, especially with the second go for it in the fourth quarter, is that I don't even think it really had anything to do with analytics at that point. Like, Dan Campbell saw what everyone else was seeing that the, the 49ers had taken over the game on both sides of the ball. Right. Uh, he understandably thought it was slipping away. He yeah. thought that was probably their last best chance to score a touchdown, even though what you said there was 10 minutes left. I thought there was a little less than that. I meant to look that up, but around 10 minutes left, apparently. Um, and like he knew that they had they weren't gonna win the game. Like he if they tied it, kicked it and, and tied it with a field goal. I mean, the 49ers could have had a game ending drive even with nine minutes left. Like the odds that the 49ers weren't scoring again were 0, 0.0. Yeah. The odds that the Falcon, excuse me, that the Lions uh, might score again were not uh, nearly as high. And he was behaving as if a road dog 
should be behaving, not just a road dog, but a road dog who's clearly outclassed should be behaving. And I, I don't even know if it, that, that's what's so frustrating about it is that I don't even know if it had anything to do with analytics and it really had to do with gut and feel, I thought. And then they just kind of converged. And that's, think, a, that's actually, I, I actually think that that's a good point. It may be something I, I would have, I, I could have explored in my, in my column, but uh, after the game, uh, Dan Campbell didn't bring his laptop and open it and say, <laughs> folks, look, here's the spreadsheet that says I should have gone for it. It says it right here, man. The, the the bars and the graphs and the charts and the numbers and the dots they're saying that I should that I should have gone for it and I listened to the spreadsheet. Corrine, uh, get up here, Corrine, uh, get up here. Uh, show them, open up that computer. Show them what it said. Show them what you made me do. <laughs> Pat Corrine, two million dollar man. <laughs> open it up. Open up your MacBook. <laughs> it's new. It's brand new. Um, uh, yeah. Corrine's too into numbers to actually have a Mac. By the way, I'm sure. No, that, oh, that, that's actually true. Um, but, and no, but Campbell said like, he was like talking like a football guy, because here's the thing about Dan Campbell. He's a football guy. Yes. yes. And it's just like, just so silly, like how toxic and curdled this whole debate has become where a, a lot of the analytics now has just become a byword for common sense. Like, like it was just like a new word being slapped on some kind of old decision-making no doubt that there are lots of coaches who are genuinely doing this because of analytics, or at least at first, like, like that's like their gateway drug to aggressive play calling and coaching. But then like, yeah, in the field of the game, maybe they get like, Oh yeah, we should have been doing this all along. And this yes. is also just common sense and not even math that we need more points and a field goal here. You know, we're just not going to win this game. If we kick a field goal. It, mm. Yes. It, that's exactly it. Like uh, basically what, Dan Campbell, I don't want to say haters, but skeptics would say is you should have just taken the field goal and taken your chances, trusted the defense. No, tr yeah, yeah, trust the defense was getting avalanched like, yeah. like the, the entire second half. It, like, like, it was like hanging on for dear life yes. not to allow a touchdown every play. Yeah. Like that, that, that's what it felt like it, yes. in the second half was like every time Brock Purdy dropped back, you're like, touchdown, this is a touchdown. <laughs> like like the, this, this Niners team has – Figured out something. It started slow, but man, they came on in the second half. And I think that the Lions, I think Campbell understood that, like, like innately, like we are, we have to maximize points. And really, points maximization goes against uh, NFL groupthink, not just now, but always, always. We're talking about generations of teams taking the points. You got to take the points. And Dan Campbell said no, and I appreciate that. I respect our king, our analytics king. Yeah, it's don't take the points, seize the points. You are the big road underdog in the NFC championship game who are suddenly behaving like an underdog and were just clearly not the best team in that game. They needed to seize the points. They just did not get them. And by the way, with Crane uh, at the press conference, Dan Campbell, I did think, I didn't think Crane should have started cowering and crying. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just, uh, that's he not a Crane. It's not even a Crane joke. That's just an analytics joke in general. He should have, he should have simply coped and cried. Like he me. should have coped like Denny did. And, uh, Crane, by the way, doing really good work uncovering uh, scandal and malfeasance in the fantasy he's, football world. He's a uh, freaking uh, Woodward. Uh, I know. Um, you know, Bob Woodward. What are we? What are we doing here? <laughs> I was talking to Pat last week, uh, name dropping. Uh, I can talk to Pat Crane, and uh, <laughs> I was like, "How are you? Have you been involved in two of the most famous fantasy football stories of all time?" Yeah, in, in two years. Uh, so we're, we're looking forward to see what Crane has planned. For next year what ben check, out, check, oh. check out real quick check out his website legendary upside really good site check out legendary upside leg up for short and i was talking about crane has planned we know what ben johnson has planned for next year and that is remaining in detroit michigan on the the u.s canadian border uh, second year in a row he was a really hot head coaching candidate um second year in a row he's kind of like josh mcdaniels in it i'm be like no i'm good I, but he's not the coach and waiting in detroit dan campbell's like 47 and there's been very fierce spin wars on this, on Ben Johnson not becoming the Commanders or Seahawks head coach, where on one side the spin is that uh, he turned him down. Like he wants to stay in Detroit. He just loves the culture. He wants to win a Super Bowl in Detroit. Yeah, I know. On the other hand, uh, he's apparently asking for $15 million uh, per season. Adam Schefter hinted that like, maybe he wasn't interviewing well. Uh, I mean, there was just there's so much spin to unpack that it's, it really is impossible to know what's true, Denny. I know that uh, like uh, assistant coach stars don't stay hot for long. Usually like the commander's job really, I thought seemed perfect. Like a gut job. He maybe didn't want to be the fall guy for a top to bottom rebuild. 
I think you made the point to me that he was going to have like an enormous rope uh, to like oh. see it through there. And this, what do you make of all this? Like, what is your theory? And I mean, it doesn't really matter what our theories are on this, <laughs> I guess. But just what are your thoughts on Ben Johnson remaining in yeah. Detroit for 2024? I mean, it, it should be good for everybody in this Detroit offense. You know, I, I think that it'll it'll you know allow us fantasy geeks to to look into 2024 and know what we're getting with these guys rather than guess with a new offensive coordinator. Uh, so it, in that way, it's good. I mean, you know, from from a from a real football standpoint, I, I I do think that Ben Johnson is taking somewhat of a risk here because enormous you know, risk. You know, look, uh, things change quickly. OK, and we have seen coaches bet on themselves and it goes awry. So we're one Jared Goff, you know, bad season away from Ben Johnson not getting a whole lot of, if any, head coaching buzz. I mean, do I think that he will? Probably. But there is a chance that if things go south in Detroit, teams are going to say, oh, you know, it's a, he, he's still asking for all that money, still wants all that power in the in the front office, whatever. We're, no, no, thank you. No, that we're we're good. You can stay in Detroit. So I don't really get it from his standpoint, uh, but I, I I welcome it from a fantasy standpoint. I mean, all the Lions fans are like, the, the, I've literally had some. The national media just can't conceive that someone wants to stay with the Lions, and it really does. It has nothing to do with the Lions. It it's not smart to be an offensive coordinator and turn down a head coaching job. It's just not smart for all the reasons you laid out. Like the opportunity, Dan Campbell himself. And his post-game speech Sunday literally said, this might be the only time we get here, boys. He, he said this, and he said he didn't think it would be, but he was speaking to the realities in the NFL of how quickly things change, and like basically savor it, cherish it, all that. And it, could, it, it very well could be the only Super Bowl run that the Dan Campbell Lions have. Only 32 of these jobs in the entire world. And I just don't know why he was being precious about taking one. And he had, I mean, he had his choice. I know. I know. He did literally have it. At least we think we, my other true out there theory, and it's just a theory to be clear. No one's reporting this. Uh, like no one's like insinuating this. I just wonder if when they were interviewing Ben Johnson, I, my theory all along has been that Ben Johnson is getting a little too much of Dan Campbell's credit. And I keep making the point. People forget the Lions offensive turnaround actually began when Dan Campbell fired Anthony Lynn midway through mm. 2021 and took over, he was play caller down the stretch in 2021. That was when like the golf began <laughs> and the lions like became watchable on offense. Dan Campbell has not called plays the past year. Ben Johnson has, but I just, I don't think uh, Dan Campbell, like everyone's like, he's such a good CEO. He's such a good leader. I think Dan Campbell is the guy like, like, like uh, articulating the vision on offense. He's not calling plays, but I just wonder if people are like, oh man, I don't know, maybe like this was more Dan Campbell than we thought, and Ben Johnson still needs more time. It doesn't really seem like that's what happened, but well, I think Ben Johnson's been getting way too much of Dan Campbell's credit. Adam Schefter reported that uh, teams were quote spooked by Ben Johnson's asking price. Um, I know you referenced that a second ago, but it could come down to that. Like, like, are you 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 really you're demanding top dollar? Like, yeah. you're a first time head coach. You just you know, you you are partly responsible for Jared Goff being good again. I don't yeah. know. I don't know, Denny. Lions fans all season have correctly been pointing out that we did not believe in them. And uh, they will be ready for us to cry and cope. When well, they- yeah, I, I believed in them in this game. <laughs> when they go 14-3 and three next year, and like, and they're going to be tweeting at us until the end of time. Yeah, they, uh, well, they, they do it about seven, eight times a day. They do. Time. They didn't, you uh, frankly, you do have to hand it to them. You do, you do, you have to <laughs> I haven't gotten like any death threats or anything. They haven't been. That no, bad. no, no, no. It's um, it's not. But it, when a look when a fan base is down that bad for that long, uh, they emerge from the depths, deformed and monstrous, and wanting revenge. You send okay? one bad tweet, and let's and, just say they don't forget about it. And it, we saw. I you know this happened with when the Jaguars were good for fifteen minutes. Uh, <laughs> You know where their fans came out from the sewers and said, "We're here for your, we're here for your head." Jags fans, they they almost got scary. I'll say they no, I'm I'm actually terrified of Jags. They fans. did like they were weird. They got like weirdly scary. Jags fans, I was like, "Wow, Jaguars fans, huh?" Uh, like they say, you know, like Chargers fans are gonna be scary. Like, wow, yikes! Well, <laughs> didn't know that not. was out there. Well, the, here's the here's the difference. 
they're in LA and they have nothing to complain about because it's nice weather. I know, man. So well, I mean, actually, Duval County probably is okay weather. They they can't be in a bad mood, is what I'm saying. That's true. Duval I mean, County, just, just but you know, per per their vitamin D intake, they can't be in a bad mood. That's true. And should we do you just want to talk about the Chargers now? Because yeah, sure. You're trying to refute you've been you've been in hot water. Uh you kept uh tweeting, <laughs> really relentlessly tweeting this video clip we did last week about Harbaugh being run heavy. And boy, yeah, the haters have been out for you. Uh, uh, you're well, all in on Harbaugh being super run heavy, which he has been at every stop. And as you point out, even with Andrew Luck at the University of Stanford. Yeah, for those who missed the last episode of Roto World Football Show, first of all, how dare you? Secondly, uh, I outlined just how hugely run heavy. Um, let me check my notes. Every single Jim Harbaugh team has ever been, okay, and including Michigan, where you know we're talking about like 120 out of 135 schools. They, you know, as far as pass rate goes, JJ McCarthy was 0 for one as a passer last year. <laughs> No, no, and no, no one's talking about this. No one's Washington, talking about this. Washington can't wait to draft JJ McCarthy. <laughs> uh, yeah, and and so so you know in San Francisco, uh, he was always bottom three in pass rate. Okay, um, and folks pointed out, and and I appreciate them reminding me because I had forgotten, I guess, that Colin Kaepernick and Alex Smith were his quarterbacks, and neither of those guys were prolific, you know, passing quarterbacks. And I get it. I get it. And Justin Herbert is potentially, I guess, a prolific passing quarterback. Now, they said, they said, I don't want to hear about any of that. I don't want to, the Niner, the, his Niners history doesn't matter. His Michigan history doesn't matter. You know what matters, Pat? His Stanford history. We're going back to 20, 2009, 2010, and we're going to see how he treated the Andrew Luck led Stanford Cardinal. Okay. Because, because that, that's different. It's, that is different. Okay. He was a he was an elite quarterback, so they were they were balanced and or pass heavy. I hear a report uh, that they were not, <laughs> so, and I don't know how to break this to Chargers fans. Uh, look, uh, Jim Harbaugh with Andrew Luck, two thousand nine. This is their, their overlapping seasons, two thousand nine and twenty ten. Luck was eightieth in the nation in pass attempts among college quarterbacks. Uh, he was he Man. was he was seventh. Had an adjusted yards per attempt. Okay, so super efficient. He was okay. amazing. Andrew Luck was actually good. Uh, Stanford was 109th out of 120 qualifying teams in pass attempts that season. 109th. Wow. Man, that is nuts. Okay, so super, super run heavy. 2010, Luck was 37th in pass attempts. The team was 71st out of 120 schools in pass attempts. <laughs> and, and again, Andrew Luck was hyper, hyper efficient. Sixth in adjusted yards per attempt. So, okay, look, do I think that the Chargers are going to be 29th or 30th or 31st in, in, in pass rate or pass attempt this year? No, no, I don't, I don't think that. But do I think that they could be 20th or 22nd or 25th? Yeah, I think that that's possible. And could Herbert be efficient and I look silly? Yeah, that that is also possible. But I'm also here to tell you, Chargers folks, that it, things would have to change for, for Justin Herbert. Because the question if, is Justin Herbert efficient? The, the answer has been no. Okay. He was 23rd in fantasy points per drop back in 2023. Mm. Uh, the previous year in 2022, he was 35th in Man. fantasy points per drop back. Do you know where he was ranked, Pat? Right around guys by the name of Zach Wilson yeah. and Carson Wentz. Oof. Wow. Was that the Wentz commander's year? Yes. Wow. First off, why is Justin Herbert, Dan Marino on checkdowns? Like, I just don't get this playing style from our so, guy. So, I do think that there is a, a, an outcome where Justin Herbert is super efficient. Like, they established the run game. The defense is really good. I think there could be a Justin Herbert transformation. I really do. Because be Alex cool. Smith was, like, close to getting run out of the league until Jim Harbaugh arrived mm -hmm. in San Francisco. And then they were the number one seed. They hosted the NFC Championship game that year. Listen. He seems to be a remarkable coach. I talked about it last week. He's a remarkable coach from like a teaching perspective. But like his offensive vision is like you may not like it, uh, but it has quite frequently been what peak offensive performance looks like. Yeah, yeah. Um, just ask everyone they've Michigan faced last year, even though it was like suspended half the time. Uh, Jim's got to work on that. Uh, yeah. You can't be suspended. You can't be just be getting suspended twice a year in the NFL. 
as a head coach. I will uh, say uh, two things. One, uh, I'm most interested in whoever is going to be the RB1 for the Chargers. And please, for the love of God, please do not talk to me about Isaiah Spiller. No. Okay. Well, that, that was oh. another point I was about to make is – Justin Herbert has never had a real running game in the NFL. And that really is like, I, I don't know even where we're at at this point on this debate, but you're not going to have like sustained passing success if your team can't run the ball like at all. And the Chargers running game has gotten progressively more embarrassing the past three years to, to the point where it was non-existent in 2023, which is a real problem since every receiver got injured. <laughs> and yeah. the, the one thing we don't know who was going to be yet, there is going to be a legitimate Chargers running running game in 2023. Yeah. And I think that will only help Justin Herbert from an efficiency perspective. I and hope so. I yeah. hope he's I hope he's good. I, I'm not I'm not hating on Herbert. Like yeah, I, I think that he, he wait he, a sec. Wait. You just called him Dan Marino on checkdowns. Uh, was that me? I thought that, I thought that was someone else in this podcast. It was me. Listen, unlike Trevor Lawrence, Justin Herbert has the tools. Okay. It take a second for that to you're trying to you were just talking about how scary Jags fans are. Uh not anymore. No, no, not anymore. Because they because they're just <laughs> mediocre now. You can't be that mad when you're mediocre. But yeah, um, true. but yeah, I mean, I mean, so I, I hope that Harbaugh gets the most. But by the way, it is very weird to me to see grandpa version of Jim Harbaugh. I know it is weird. It is he's aged a lot. He's a man. I know, I know. We we need like the 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 khaki daredevil of 10 years ago i mean i think uh, i think he actually is like becoming bear bryant i know he, he doesn't have much hip movement anymore i've noticed when he's walking around he's a little stiff it's a, our guy's aged a lot he played in the nfl lot. over 10 years a um, lot man, that's a, jim harbaugh's playing career by the way you, you go to his pro, pro football reference this guy has had uh what is known as a in the industry as a football life yes uh, yeah, it's an absolutely crazy, crazy, crazy career. Just real before we move on to the next thing, my my lasting memory of Harbaugh uh, was when he played for the Colts, and oh, they yeah. got they got all the way to the AFC title game against Pittsburgh, and he threw a hail mary yes. that fell into the lap of a Colts receiver, and it was knocked out at the last second, and the Colts were this close to going to the Super Bowl to face the Cowboys and the probably, Dallas Cowboys yeah. and probably lose by 100 points, but they would have uh, been utterly demolished. The line for that game probably would have been like 17 and a half, right. so, but that, that was, that was the, that was the most insane ending to a game in my childhood. I love that game. That was an iconic game of the nineties. Yeah. We're an iconic podcast of the twenties and we'll be right back after this. It's a double dip of big 10 basketball on Tuesday that can only be streamed on Peacock Illinois and Ohio State tip things off at 6.30 p.m. Eastern as each team looks to boost their big dance resume. Then at 9 p.m., another chapter of an in-state rivalry will be written when upset-minded Michigan, the aforementioned Michigan, takes on Michigan State and East Lansing. And don't forget, find all your favorite NBC Sports shows on Amazon Music. Just head to Amazon.com slash NBC Sports. Seeing a lot of wows in our chat here. I thought you guys were like ooing and eyeing at my segue. Um, but you were, just talking about, you were just talking about Harbaugh's age. Well, we're talking about the fact that I was talking with producer Adam that John Harbaugh is older than Jim. I would have guessed that Jim is 19 years older. It's dude, being a college coach ages you like unbelievably. Like these NFL coaches think they grind, like they're not on like private jets, like trying to recruit people in like Idaho, like every weekend. But yeah, there's all these guys are getting out of college for a reason. Like it's the worst lifestyle imaginable. Even though they pay you like ten million dollars in state money every year, yeah, I was gonna say that's. I'm sure it pays off. It pays uh, very well, but it is a horrible, horrible lifestyle. Uh, you know, it's a horrible lifestyle, Denny, <laughs> is being an Arthur Smith skill player. God. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, oh I man, I, I I just can't. I mean, I, I know it's like a, the ultimate fantasy bro opinion, but. I, I've never seen a less serious hire than going from Matt Canada to Arthur Smith as your fantasy in bio, fantasy, fantasy in bio, it proudly in bio, and I, I, I just, I'm actually at a loss of, for words for what what the plan is here, how this like it can be presented to Steelers fans, like how are they gonna have a press conference? About oh. it? Like Arthur's, I, listen, we know you're upset about Matt Canada, uh, we got the solution here. He's a, a, a little guy named Art Smith. Maybe you've heard of him. And we it, found someone worse. Yeah, we found the only person like uniformly worse than Matt. Oh Canada. man. Uh, yeah. I, I thought I thought it was 
a joke. I thought you were. I thought they were messing around when they were like, "Oh, we're we're interviewing Arthur Smith." I was like, "Okay, well, that's not going anywhere." Obviously. And I was like, "I don't know, maybe like they have a huge contract with FedEx, and this is like a favor to the company or something <laughs> to interview Art." Uh, but no, it was not a favor. No, it's uh, it's real. I guess you know. I mean, if we're gonna if we're gonna analyze it, Pat, we're gonna have to say, but we're gonna have to say the line. It's Najee season. <sighs> I mean, it's like, but is it really even yeah. like yeah. i mean like who as we know it was it just gonna be like a four-man committee for absolutely no reason in pittsburgh next season? well oh, oh i see what you're saying yeah right right well i mean look i i will say i i'm not i'm no arthur smith uh apologist no one is um probably including his family members but um <laughs> You know, we're one we're one year removed. 2022, the Falcons were third in rush EPA and fifth in rushing success rate. So they have been good. I, I mean, last year was actually catastrophic after they yeah, drafted Bijan Robinson. I mean, I mean, their, their their rushing efficiency fell off a cliff with Bijan Robinson in the backfield. So I'm, I can't really piece those two things together. But uh, you know, should hey. Should be good for Harris. Should be good for Jalen Warren. I will say that uh, George Pickens will probably leave the NFL before <laughs> week eight. <laughs> Seriously. like Just trade him now. I, there's no point oh. in pretending this is going to work. Seriously, just trade him now. Please. Like, there, there's genuinely no point in this experiment. He does have like almost a... I was about to say he's a Drake London type skill set. He really doesn't. He's more deep speed. They both are always tightly covered. But Pickens is not like a hand fighter the way Drake London is. No, yeah, I, so, yeah, I don't think he can really do the Drake London role. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess there is a there is a point like in fantasy drafts. I got, I know it's it's not even February and we're talking, but but I, I will say there there is a point where people are going to say, well, I'll never ever draft George Pickens, and he'll he could fall to an ADP where you're like, ah, I mean, yeah. come on, yes. yeah, don't do it. I mean, especially if is Mason Rudolph going to be the quarterback? I believe Mason is a free agent, but. Uh, they were sure talking about Mason Rudolph a lot at their season ending press conferences earlier this week, the Steelers and the owner saying Mason Rudolph came and showed, I think what we're capable of when we do get quality quarterback play. And he also said he had not seen Rudolph's ceiling as a player. Oh. Man, oh man. Uh, man, down. Absolutely horrific. Kenny Pickett too is like, I'm sitting. It's the, this is a classic. <laughs> I'm sitting right here. And you're talking about Mason Rudolph's ceiling. Like, come on, man. I mean, and, and yeah. And what, what trust do we have? What reason do we have to believe that Arthur Smith can develop Kenny Pickett into Zero a answer. viable NFL quarterback? I mean, <laughs> Not no chance. Now no, no, no. he does he does fit the ethos, the Pittsburgh ethos, hard work in we're gonna grind it out three yards at a time, that sort of thing. So I guess that's what the Steelers want to want to keep doing. And you know, Pat, they're probably gonna win eight games. And, no, and they'll, they'll win nine. It'll be nine and eight. Eight and like, eight, eight, eight and nine games, they'll make the playoffs. They'll, they'll be one and eight and go on an eight game winning streak with a quarterback yeah. who's not currently on the roster. Right. With Josh Dobbs. That's who it'll be. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I you know, so I, I don't I don't really I don't really understand the long term plan. I, the fact that Arthur Smith gets another chance so quickly after his offense failed completely in Atlanta is just baffling. And he I, I think we talked Arthur Smith like really did like crumble, like, like let the outside noise get to him. And there's like one charitable thing to maybe say about Art. He was perfectly fine as the Titans offensive coordinator. Like you said before, he had like so many like hot button players at his disposal that people would actually complain about not using. He was okay as the Falcons offensive coordinator, but he, he totally like just cracked under the pressure last year. I mean, his press conferences were like a weekly cry for help. He, <laughs> like, he won't have to deal with that quite as much as the offensive coordinator. I mean, I guess ask Matt Canada about that, but uh, or at least it's to me, Mike Tomlin taking like the slings and arrows uh, after the games, so or maybe, He'll be a little better when he doesn't have to be the team CEO and he can just focus on calling plays again. Mm -hmm. But no, that's like, that's all I got. It's not, uh, it just doesn't seem like a serious hire to me. It, it really doesn't. Is Kellen Moore to the Eagles a serious hire for uh, Sirianni? Nick Sirianni is already at the point where like, uh, well, you have fired everybody. So you're out of excuses yeah. and you really, really, really got to hope these new hires are actually good. He's made two hires, a coordinator, at least with, uh, well, Vic Fangio has an immaculate NFL resume. Colin Moore's is getting more questionable. 
but he is a legitimate NFL offensive coordinator. What do you think about Kellen Moore to the Eagles as offensive coordinator? Uh, I, I don't, I don't know if it is going to change much because this is Sirianni's offensive system. Well, and... it's also the Jalen Hurts offensive system too, and he's like never had he's not, he hasn't really worked with a dual threat, Kellen Moore. It's so like, do we even know like will he let Jalen Hurts be Jalen Hurts, or will he trade a square peg round hole? So you know. So. The Eagles used uh, pre-snap motion at the second lowest rate in the league last year. I mean, stuff like that, I think, makes a, an offense stale, makes it predictable. Um, you know, we've talked ad nauseum on this podcast about how the Eagles continue to operate on offense as if their defense was good. And so maybe, you know, maybe maybe the best offensive hire that they made was Vic Fangio uh, so that he can create a defense that allows the Jalen hurts run Eagles offense to operate the way it did in 2022. Maybe, you know, maybe that's, that's the key really. And Kellen Moore is, is there maybe to get a, a little more creative. I do think that this Eagles offense became very predictable uh, to the point of, of almost like crin cringe inducing uh, paralyzation. Yeah. It was. Yeah. Bad. Where just teams knew what was coming. I mean, I, I've, I've read uh, post game interviews with players who were like, yeah, we knew exactly what they were going to do in, in critical <laughs> situations. And, and we see that sometimes, I mean, the Eagles, this is not the first time ever, but when you, when you hear that from defensive players, you know, something has gone terribly, terribly wrong. So maybe Kellen Moore can inject some creativity into the system. I believe that most recently happened um, with Lamar Jackson and Greg yeah. Roman, where he was like, I would appreciate it if the opposing defense wasn't calling out the plays. Uh, that would be nice. And that was happening every play. Though. Yeah. Not, not just sometimes, but. <laughs> and then they fired him and had another historic EPA season. And uh, the, the where's the math? Where's your God now? Where's the math now on the, the Ravens? Um, yeah. We're, we're looking into that. We are looking into that. Man, that was a crazy game. Uh, it wasn't a great Lamar game, but he wasn't, he wasn't the issue they lost. I guess he was one of many issues, but wow, it, that was. They, this is uh, what's happened to the Ravens, man. It, just I mean, always... it's the same deal no matter what, no matter what changes in Baltimore. You, they fall behind by one touchdown and they absolutely melt down. <laughs> and yeah. and th they got to get a, my theory on the Ravens. I, I don't care what like the run game EPA stats, are, like what the efficiency was. They didn't have a serious backfield. Like they've got to get like actual running backs to employ. Like if you're going to be like this run based or balanced offense, you want people to fear the dual threat under center. You have to have like an actual threat in the back. Like, like no one is game planning for Gus Edwards or even Keaton Mitchell. Maybe they were for Keaton Mitchell. They well, missed. Got, they missed that guy. They did. They, you got to have a running back though. That like the, the opposing defensive coordinator like at least has to like mention in the meetings. Like Steve Spagnuolo is probably like, yeah whatever. Like Gus Edwards. Like, Gus, so. Gus whatever his name is. Yeah. yeah but I believe Justin. his last name. Is they guy, yeah, they have a guy named Justice. That's kind of funny. Uh, but yeah, anyways, yeah, we don't care about that. Uh, how are we going to not allow any Ravens wide receivers to get open? They I have, uh, have to get a real running game. I wish real Todd Munkin. I wish Todd Munkin would have read my uh, funnel defense column because I uh, begged him not to throw into the teeth of the league's best secondary, and he was twelve percent over his expected pass rate against the Chiefs, which makes no sense. No. Gus no. Edwards got stopped for no gain one time, and they're like, "Well, we're never doing that again." Like they, six handoffs, you know, six. Was, yeah, I don't understand how how that happened a lot to unpack there a lot to unpack in atlanta where the aforementioned arthur smith wasted drake london he wasted Bajon robinson he wasted kyle pitts even he wasted tyler algier even uh, probably one of those teams that were just crying out for hire the first mcveigh or shanahan assistant yeah. you can find and they did do that and zach robinson has been brought in along with raheem morris he is the new offensive coordinator for the Falcons, Denny, he was with the yeah the Rams. He was their passing game quarter, coordinator and their quarterbacks coach. He does not have a quarterback currently to coach up. I'm assuming it's not going to be Desmond Ritter or Taylor Heineke again. Uh, but the Zach Robinson hire probably very good for the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, correct? I yes, I am obsessed with this, and you know the best ball bros already know. But you're going to be able to get like really good discounts on. Pitts on uh, Drake London on Bij on Bijan, you know, like like you you will these guys will be available uh, for a while as if Arthur Smith is still in town and folks he's not they actually have a modern NFL mind coaching these guys now and that's awesome. Uh, he also has the benefit Zach Robinson has the benefit of having 
gone to, uh, I believe, elementary school with our buddy Pete Overzet. Wow, I did, did not know that. I did not yeah. know that there was a, a ship chasing. Uh, did you hear about this? Tree connection. You I did not. I didn't hear about that. Everybody's talking about it. Uh, Zach Robinson. Um, <laughs> sorry. So, so uh, yeah. Uh, so we're going to have to talk to Pete about uh, what Zach is going to do in Atlanta, since I'm sure they talked about it in 1998 or whatever. <laughs> if I ever become an NFL head coach, Pete, um, here's what I'm going to do: not <laughs> let Drake London. Uh, wither and die so i can continually target uh jonah smith um, yeah i just what if the quarterback though is going to be very very the good news is raheem morris is like the right hire for this too or anyone who goes to mcveigh finishing school seems to come out uh, with just like a totally new perspective on football but raheem was already praised as like one of the best leaders seems very open-minded um, so everything is coming up falcon skill players with the humongous exception uh, they've got to find a legitimate quarterback. Uh, th this yeah. quarterback situation was, you want to talk about not serious. Desmond Ritter and Taylor Heineke was not serious at quarterback. For the no, Falcons. hashtag not serious. You know who is serious, Pat, is uh, Jake Browning. I'm just putting it out there. Oh, stop. You got to stop at this one. Uh, uh, every time oh, I yeah, do. Wow. Uh, screen. Wow, cool. How did every... the, like, and me the other team, like maybe they're throwing a friggin' screen. Can you just wait two seconds and then sack him? It's like he's like Ryan Tannehill or Jared Goff. Don't respect the fake. Look, the fact that you hate the most accurate quarterback in the game, I can't help that. Wow. Okay. Didn't know that. Uh, <laughs> uh, every time I do a deep dive, Jake Browning keeps popping up at me. Oh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. At, I'm good at everything. And and yet he's gonna back up Joe Burrow. I can't believe he completed a three yard wide receiver screen. Oh, I'm so That's mad. Not... <laughs> I can't believe we have to take one more short break. We will be right back after this. Stream back-to-back -back Big Ten basketball games on Wednesday evening. Indiana starts the party at 6.30 p.m. Eastern when the Lady Hoosiers take on Maryland in College Park. Then in the nightcap, Caitlin Clark and Iowa hit the road for a date with Northwestern at 8 p.m. Watch both conference showdowns exclusively on Peacock. Are they playing uh, Are they playing a game at Cole Fieldhouse? Um, I don't, I don't I'm know. I'm kidding. No, Colt, no, they're, they don't play games there anymore. Is that the yeah. Hoosiers movie? It's no, man. It's Cole Fieldhouse. It's at the, at the University of Maryland. It's legendary oh, basketball stadium. I didn't maybe. know you knew anything about Maryland Athletics. You've been back to like you've never heard of it uh, uh, when I bring uh, it up. I I I went to Cole many times and and uh, was devastated when they moved to wherever they play. Where, what is it, producer Adam? Is it Verizon Center? What is it oh, called? God, that sounds absolutely awful. Unless Verizon's our sponsor. I'm Wait, sorry. is it is it Com? It's Comcast, isn't it? Wow. Yeah, Ooh. which is awesome. That nice. is awesome. It's uh, you know what's gonna be awesome is when uh, Caitlin Clark puts up a fifty burger on Northwestern. That's my prediction. It, it, Northwestern famously bad at covering three, uh, at guarding three pointers. You really, really, really should watch Caitlin Clark on Peacock Wednesday evening. If you've not seen her play yet. It is like, oh, I, I've seen it. I've seen her and I, I will watch it. It's Pete Maravich reincarnated. Mm -hmm. It is really, really quite something. Uh, you know, it's qu quite uh, something, Denny. Uh, <laughs> uh, the Browns, they've hired Ken Dorsey. Uh, which I think were you the one insisting Ken Dorsey did nothing wrong? Is Bill? Uh, no, 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 no. Kyle, Kyle, was Kyle, the world's right. biggest Ken Dorsey. Truth yeah, well, Kyle was really on. Like, <laughs> if Kyle had a Wikipedia, I would definitely find out that he was like Ken Dorsey's stepbrother. <laughs> uh, he was really, really, really defending Ken Dorsey. Uh, he's the offensive coordinator. I kind of hope he's not the play caller. Kevin Stefanski is one of the best play yeah. callers in the entire NFL. Yeah. What do you think is going on with uh, Ken Dorsey to Cleveland? I think it, because of what you just said, I, I think it doesn't really matter. I think that uh, it's, as long as Stefanski keeps play calling duties, which he will. I mean, Stefanski was on a heater this year. OK, uh, he, he's had some of the most amazing play calling streaks uh, in, in like modern memory, NFL memory. 2020 with Baker Mayfield this year with well, everybody but uh, Deshaun Watson. And uh, and so, yeah, I don't I don't think it matters a whole lot. I will say Ken, Ken Dorsey definitely lost his job because Tyler Bass, Tyler Bass missed one field goal. Obviously, well, that, that, yeah, that is back on that. the Kyle thing now. No, no. But, but that that is a, if if Bass makes that field goal, then Dorsey's oh, yeah, still yeah. the offense corner today, not just then. Was that the Broncos game? Yeah. I, can't yeah, I mean, so so Tyler Bass, buddy, you you cost uh, you cost your boy bet big time. It's hard to keep track of the 2023 Bills lore. I mean, it's really, really hard to keep track of the 2023 Broncos lore. I just wrote them up for my season-ending compendium. Oh, I thought, should I save the Zay Flowers thing for Thursday? Uh, or do yeah. you want to talk? 
All right, we'll save that for Thursday. We're going to yeah. get into more player talks. On this. this is kind of a short show, but it's all like coaching stuff. And but Denny, on air, uh, we need to come up with some bits for Super Bowl week, by the way. Yeah. yeah. I'll be I'll be there on the ground and like with your VFX budget um at the green screen. I think I can be like the ideas man and you can be like the actor and implement them on the, the, Maryland, right. the sound stage. The green screen uh sound stage budget has been cut to four hundred and seventy five thousand dollars. Did so. you know that they shipped me on accident two pallets of those Bali things that they have to stick to you? Um, they, <laughs> meant, they, meant, they meant to ship them ship them to you. All right. Well, you can you can forward them to my mailing address <laughs> for all the Super Bowl skits we have planned. Yeah, uh, Denny and I will be in Las Vegas, Nevada next week. We we do need to start coming up with ideas. I'm all listen. I'm already whining about my flight, by the way, because I have to wake up at like four in the morning. To get uh, first off, I tried to call you about this, and we never well, we never linked up. We and, did. Uh, <laughs> I knew you would do that. Why'd you do that? Or did you have what someone you- book it for you? What were you gonna do about it? What were you gonna were you gonna uh, tell tell Delta to have a different flight? I would have told you to, there's probably Vegas is a very well serviced city by the airlines, I must say. Even St. Louis is like 90 direct flights a day to Las Vegas. So it was pretty easy for me to yeah. find an afternoon. I, I I will be barely functional for the first 48 hours. I just yeah. want to put that in. Yikes. Well, good. <laughs> Check it out then on the Rotor Football Show next week. So for Denny Carter, I am Patrick Darty. We'll be back and well rested this Thursday with Mr. Kyle Dvorak. Join us then.